there's a kind of cliche that in the down markets is when everyone builds. There's less excitement, less distraction. I interview people in the podcast and they're like, oh my God, the last week, the last two weeks are crazy. And what they're getting at is the word crazy means distraction. It means yeah. people are sending you telegram messages. This company's doing this. This is a massive change. And so maybe it's not about the up and down. Maybe it's about volatility and not having your Twitter or your telegram blow up with messages means you're more productive. I wanted to ask you a little bit more. You mentioned Elizabeth Warren's declaration of war against crypto, and that seems to be a quite overt direction that the SEC and the United States federal government is taking against crypto. Is this something that you see a, a number of founders concerned about? Do they just throw caution to the wind and jump in regardless? Do you think the existential risk of the U.S like cl clamping down hard and almost banning all crypto projects and crypto trading and the influence of the United States and the Western world. Is that a real threat? Because that if it felt to me like we had passed the point of escape velocity. You have hundreds of companies in your crypto project. I talk to people who are super, super smart. They're running projects with do dozens or hundreds of people with millions and millions of dollars. It felt like this is beyond experimental mode. And now this talk of banning crypto, what do you think about this? First of all, I've worked for U.S. companies and I've lived in the U.S., but I'm not a U.S. citizen. So I'm always wary of throwing in my two cents when I'm not resident in that country. So I, it makes me a little bit, there's an element of sadness when I see the U.S. turning its back on an industry that I love and I think has a huge potential. What we are seeing is a lot of founders are very mobile, right? I don't have the stats to hand, but we've seen quite a lot of teams from the U.S. get through to our investment committee too, which is the, the stage before we offer, that they can offer um, to go on our accelerator. But I understand some of those founders are in, <clears throat> they're in like Lisbon in Portugal, some of them are in Dubai, <clears throat> some of them are in London, some of them are in Mexico, Canada. Uh, so... Maybe there is, and I don't have enough data points for this, so this is some of this is, I suppose, anecdotal, but it does seem that founders are maybe migrating outside of the U.S. or else they're looking to be based in the U.S., but most of their energy and efforts will be overseas. That seems to be the trend that's emerging. From somebody not living in the U.S., outside perspective, why do you think the U.S. is so strongly targeting crypto as an enemy? I can just guess. I think... It, it does seem that there is quite a, most of the people who are regulating so hard against crypto are over 70. So they don't come from a position where they really understand the space. And I also would assume that whoever is lobbying them the hardest is probably not putting a very positive slant on the space. Money talks to some degree. So I think crypto doesn't really have a strong lobby. I think we will learn from this. I think there will be a very strong lobby that will emerge. That will maybe give crypto an edge in time, but it's one of the things you got to retreat, rebuild, and then work forward. So I think those are some of the things. I also think the FTX debacle, yeah. whatever you want to call it like that. And from what I understand, and I, I do need to check this, but as far as I understand, Gary Gensler was very close to giving FTX regulatory clearance on a whole range of different things. It's pretty incredible that somebody's in the tent, somebody who was very close to the traditional financial system, it got exposed in such a way that I, I think everybody must be doubting themselves afterwards going, hang on, if somebody, and I think there was always signs, I'm always skeptical as a footnote, I'm always skeptical of somebody in crypto who in one cycle appears, explodes, and there's, you need somebody around for two cycles to really understand the ups and the downs. But th th that aside, I, I think the US establishment is going, you know, when somebody we thought was reputable turned out to not be and turned out to blow up in such a way, I, I think everybody then is trying to distance themselves and go, we had nothing to do with it and trying to put as much distance as possible. So maybe FTX fallout is also a consideration. Yeah. So having a uh, kind of a strong incumbent financial market, which probably has all the incentive and money to lobby the points in government like Elizabeth Warren, who are most likely to listen to it. There's also obviously FTX fallout, which seems to me like it's just, maybe it was a function of the culture, but it seemed like any bank could have done the same thing. And in fact, like they did, right? Silicon Valley yeah. Bank went under, but it wasn't for the like the blatant, I don't know if it's labeled fraud now in hindsight, but moving money 
out of an account that you said would be just for trading. It seemed like yeah. it had really nothing to do with crypto, but maybe the culture behind running a crypto company with super young people in the Bahamas yeah. that is just like figuring out as you go. If you go into a bank, they're just going to have this culture of regulation and oversight. And, yeah. and that just pervades every bank because they have to open up the banking charter and they have to get the licensure and they have to have a chief finance. Like everyone is thinking about oversight and regulation. But I think you found something really interesting. And that is that uh, the earlier regulation in the US pushed a lot of firms offshore. And the fact that FTX was offshore meant that as far as I know, they used QuickBooks for their accounting system. There was a whole lot of things that were just, they were like Swiss cheese. There was holes in so many things that they did and nobody was ever there to check it. They bought a lot of people really nice property in the Bahamas. And I understand that meant that they had carte blanche in the Bahamas to be and do as they choose. And that's really unhealthy because they had no checks. There was no checks and balances mm -hmm. on a very young founder. There are stories that when big firms like Sequoia were talking about investing, he was like, okay, we'll talk about investing after we play League of Legends and whatever. And it was all this sort of culture. It was almost too good to ask questions, which is very suspect, but Again, I think the fact that FTX wasn't regulated is a, a, is a core problem. What I don't understand, and maybe you can tell me as somebody who's sitting outside of the US, Coinbase seemed to do everything they could to be regulated, to go down that route, to get listed. Circle, who are affiliated with Coinbase, Jeremy Al 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 Alistair, I think his name is. But they, they really did everything they could the right way, as far as I understand. And now they have been thrown under the bus can't quite understand that part. For me, that's the question. When you had people who wanted to be your natural partner in the US be the flag bearer, and then we got distracted or the US got distracted with FTX, and now it's okay, it's all bad. That part confuses me. Yeah, I feel like a couple of influences play into this. One is the United States owns the global reserve currency. And so that, yeah. and in a declining empire, is one of the last remaining major leverage points that a country has from a federal perspective. So yeah. crypto, Bitcoin in particular, is the off-ramp to that. And so that's the yeah. escape hatch that people can run to if the United States yeah. starts printing off its debts and inflation starts really grinding up. And so they want to block the exits before they crank and start printing. That would be yeah. one influence. The second, as you mentioned, like the lobbying is the existing in infrastructure is the, the whole world, the financial markets really run on U.S. banking rails as determined after World War II, those huge system, influence yeah. and regulation. So I think that's another thing. And when the crypto market is cranking and it's just booming, then you don't have any political leverage. Everyone's like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. But then as soon as there's the FTX, as soon as the market crashes, as soon as we hit the political instability, now people prioritize safety over innovation. So that's where I think the change in the political winds to look at crypto as the enemy means that I think of these systems oftentimes as analogous to organic systems. You have your body and then everything in it is looking for threats of invaders. And when it detects one, your immune system recognizes it and it attacks. The threat to the establishment regulated body is non-regulated entities. So you say, why would they attack Coinbase? Sometimes the body has an autoimmune disease where it recognizes its own self as the enemy and it does that because of a, like a mischaracterization of what itself is. And so I think the federal government is now reconceptualizing itself as a U.S. dollar entity. Like the federal government and the U.S. dollar are the same thing. They are preserving yeah. themselves. And so they look at Coinbase and they say, oh, you're the exit out of here. Even though you're regulated, we shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. You shouldn't have been allowed to even get regulation in the first place, thus attack dogs. And they yeah. figure out a way to bring them down. I also think the nature of the Bitcoin narrative, as you say, that it is the off-ramp. There's a lot of chat about de-dollarization around the globe and Balaji Srivastava's million dollar best. All of those things, they don't go unnoticed. So I think they do bring us into conflict with regulators and with the powers that be, because it is a direct challenge. But I don't know if you've read, there's a book called The Sovereign Individual. Maybe you're familiar with it. Yeah. Written in like the mid nineties. Reese Mogg and James Davidson. It's very interesting. They laid out a lot of this stuff before Bitcoin is around. And they had a phrase that like cyber commerce would lead to, I think what they called it, it was some sort of a digital, they didn't call it digital currency, but the equivalent. But they laid out a lot of the stuff that as governments start to lose power and as they start to print more, 
there is a, a temptation for people to start moving into the digital and moving away from being trapped within a traditional nation state and being trapped within traditional regulations and taxation. So that's something people have been talking about for a long time. And I think the powers that be are, okay, we can't let that go too far. And we're going to have a very interesting maybe decade ahead as these kind of yeah. forces play out against each other.